So, as he's introduced me, uh, my name is Brian West. I'm one of the core founders of the FreeSwitch project. There's a lot of things um, that I've learned over the years. How many people in here have built a commercial product based on open source? How many of those products seem like they launched into the sales channel a little bit too soon? Did you have that happen? You know what happens when that takes place. Your engineering resources will be split in half because you will have half of your engineers working with customers and you'll have half trying to keep the product alive. I don't know why we continue to do this because if we do those steps, your team morale is very low. There's no reason to keep doing this to ourselves. I've experienced this firsthand um, when we worked at Barracuda. It was the same thing. And then you, you expect that, oh, we have a product, it's selling, we need to scale up our engineering. No, your shoestring budget is what you get. You don't get any new people, no budget. You have to make do with what you have. And I'm pretty sure a lot of us have been in that situation. Right? And it's not a good place to be. It feels like you never get anything accomplished. So what, what I like about what we do with FreeSwitch is we're trying to build something that, can, that would be available for you to build products and services on that's stable. And we're marching towards that at a rapid pace. But it takes a lot of little things to get there. And a lot of things that people don't realize happen in the background. They think this is magical when we release a free switch uh, release. It, there's a lot of work involved. A lot of people, a lot of moving parts. One of the things that I like to do is the, the bug marshalling. That's, that's one thing. We need more people to do bug marshalling. Um, the second thing I hear a lot of is, oh, I don't know how to code, ergo I can't help. How many people in here know how to code? Good. How many people in here wish they knew how to code? <laughs> so, 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 bad code, is that what it is? <laughs> so, it, when I started bug marshalling uh, for the Asterisk Project, uh, way back in the day, um, I'd get up every morning, look at what's new, see what the data is, see if I can replicate it. At that point in time, I knew a little bit of Perl, enough to be dangerous, basically. And that was about it. I knew how to compile things. Necessity dictated that I learn C. So I learned C and started coding C modules for asterisk. And that's what's, what's led me to here. How I got from that to free switch is an awesome joyride of excitement sometimes to, to be able to work on something like this. So I, I talk about, you already got that. This is another example of something little in the world that leads to something big. I, it, do you guys know what this is? This is CRS-7 that had the IDA, International Docking Adapter, headed to IASS. This cost the taxpayers $110 million. And it was a two-foot strut that failed, a little tiny thing. And it brought the entire rocket down, which that was a black eye for SpaceX. Now this one, this is American Airlines Flight 191. This is something that started back in 1979. Um, the maintenance, which took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They went against the, against the manufacturer's recommendations for removing the engines from the wing. They removed the engine and pylon in one assembly instead of taking the engine off the pylon and the pylon off the wing. And putting it back, they crossed microfractures at the back of the pylon. And when the plane took off at O'Hare, the engine went up over the wing and took out the hydraulic system. And this picture is what happened. It killed 273 people. And this is one of those things you couldn't put a price tag on. It also killed two on the ground. A lot of things we do, I, we have to stop and think, do we make the same mistakes over and over again? You know, you hear history repeats itself. Well, no, history doesn't repeat itself. We repeat history. And sometimes we don't learn when that happens. So what we have to do is take a failure. Because don't be afraid to fail, because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail at something in life. Everyone does. 
learn from them, move on, because that's how you grow. So writing software is a demanding job. You have customers, you have users, you have people that don't pay you a dime that act like they pay you money. I think we all have some of those. Um, so the, the customers, the, the users, um, it's, 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 it's a lot to deal with. I pretty much do all of those roles on the FreeSwitch team. Um, my title is the General Operations Director. Um, I just pulled that out of a hat and made it up. Uh, the acronym for that is God, if you didn't catch that. <laughs> so how many people in here use open source in their businesses and pay for commercial assistance with it? See, those are the customers and users that help drive open source forward. Because without them, some of these projects wouldn't be where they are now. For example, FreeSwitch doesn't have a huge corporate sponsor. We're a small team building a very large piece of software that's very complex. I get asked all the time, what's it like to work with FreeSwitch all the time? I bet you get to do fun stuff all the time. Absolutely not. I get to fix bugs. And that's not, you know, it kind of, it's sometimes you get a fun one, but it's not, it's, it's very rare that you get that. So you, there's a lot to go. And uh, the way that people can help out in open source, and this is, this is fun, because I put a little uh, cookie in our, or should I say teapot, in our Jira create a bug. If you go create a bug on our Jira, you, the guidelines state you need to read the guidelines start to finish, read everything, fill everything out. This is one of those times where you can't, it, it, you're trying to show the user how to do it right. And there's critical bits of information that need to be reported because you can have five users report the same bug and have 10 different things that don't match up. This is, this is common. You have to train your users to not do that. And it takes little things to do that. And this particular teapot reference, it's a, I'm a little teapot in one of the descriptions. Um, asking for the, the master hash of FreeSwitch that they're using. Most people just ignore it. I've only had two people ever ask me about the teapot, and one was Giovanni, which he helped write the FreeSwitch book, and the other was Jim O'Brien from Counterpath. So those are the only two people that actually read. Now, the sad part about this is many of the people filing bugs are engineers, and we all know what engineers are. They're kind of lazy, aren't they? So they skim over things, and, and, and I'm guilty of this too. And I'm probably the world's worst person to, to write documentation. I write documentation on a level that's engineering. You know, people could understand it if they kind of have a background. Um, so I usually write that kind of documentation and hand it off to the, our volunteers that are on the docs team. Then they turn it into nice English, even though English is not their native language. They write awesome English, translate well in Google. And, and, and that's a little thing that these people that are helping the project out are doing. And it all adds up. And I hope that some, if, if some of you aren't giving back or trying to give back or don't think that you can give back to open source or get involved, think again. There's so many things you can do to help. It's, it's the bug marshaling, checking the, is all the data on the JIRA correctly, asking questions, collecting logs. Hey, I've, I've got enough information. Let me try to lab this up. If, if I can replicate it, great. I can replicate it, put it in the bug, and then it's easier for the developers to take that nice, neat, packaged bug and fix it in record time. Because there's a lot of time wasted um, trying to get information. And, and it's, it's a hard thing to solve. And we've tried, and, and we've had customers and users reporting bugs on our mailing list. Now, we had one, and, and one this week that was pointed out in 2012, and we had asked him to file a JIRA. He never did. That crash is still in there. It's a very obscure crash using the callbacks in Lua, but it's there. But nobody ever filed a bug. So that was the reason we don't want bug reports on the mailing list, because they slip through the cracks. So that's one of our bug reporting guidelines that we do. So 
there's something that we do working in communications. And we're all probably guilty of this one. We don't communicate. It's very difficult to get everybody talking, everybody on the same page. I, for one, love to share knowledge and show people how to do things. Because if I show somebody how to do it, then you know, they'll go do it and maybe document it and or test it out even more for me because I just don't have the hours in a day. I, I, I'd have, if there were 48 hours in a day, I couldn't get what I get done. It's just not possible. I'm, I'm always behind. I will never be done with my list. But all I can do is try and not let it grind me down or get upset about it or get dramatic about it. Because you know sometimes when you're under pressure, the smallest things can make you snap. And I'm doing really much better at that now. I, I've just come to that. It, it's, so we don't test free switch as much as we should. We're working on that. We're going to work on building some automated testing frameworks. I have tons of ideas of how we're going to do it. Um, I'm, I don't know or have the knowledge yet to orchestrate that. FreeSwitch is complex software, and you have to do things like, one of the things I do when I test, we have a, a video three-way call we do, and what I use there is FreeSwitch's uh, snapshot feature, and I generate PN, um, QR codes, and I snapshot where the video is supposed to be, and I verify if those QR codes are where I think they're supposed to be. And the same thing can be applied to like Mod Conference when we're doing the MCU. You could put random and change them, and then scan it again and check. Am I getting the results I expect? And that's, it's, it's an awesome way to test, but it's not something that I have been able to orchestrate automatically yet. It's, it's coming. It's something that's, that's in my list of things to do. So we've, we've discussed documentation. It's, it's nice to interact with your users on your mailing list because if you can answer their questions on the mailing list, Hopefully, and I've been doing this lately, if I see something that goes on the mailing list that should probably be on Confluence, I will just forward it to the docs mailing list, and those guys will digest it and, and make it into something. So the little thing of me just forwarding this over, hey guys, this might be a good thing, that's one little thing I did, but that might help hundreds of people along the way that don't know how to do something. So. What you can do to help is the, in this, when you're writing code, doing anything, see, if you see a problem, report it. I'm not talking TSA-like, you know, I, I don't want to go there. But if you see something in the software misbehaving, say something, because we do have customers and users that hoard knowledge. Oh, I've known about that bug for four weeks. How was I supposed to know that? I, you know, Miss Cleo's not alive anymore, and I I'm, I'm surely can't read anybody's mind. So, you know, I, I'm trying to corral the end users into being interactive with this. We'll help. If you don't know how to do something, great. There's a lot of stuff I don't know how to do either. But I punch it into Google, figure it out, and move on. And some people don't learn like that. Absolutely don't learn like that. And there is, it's, it's my failing, uh, personally, it's hard for me to teach somebody something because I'm very terse with, with things. And poor Kathleen and Sharon are on board with us now and helping, uh, helping me with that aspect of how I work in the project. Because if you, if you didn't meet me in person and you just went off what is on the mailing list, you see my, my replies, they're usually one sentence, right to the point, you would think I'm a huge asshole. Because I'm, just, I'm right to the point, you need this, and I'm done. I'm, I'm not gonna fluff it up with words, I'm honestly too busy. And we're trying to get that where it's not like that anymore. But that's, uh, you know, that's things that we have to do as an open source project. And I had, I had a couple other ideas that I was going to float out there, but they're, they're, they're not coming to me. But um, it, does anybody in the audience have any questions? Well, that's pretty much everything I had to talk about. If you want to come up here and get one of our free switch uh, tech preview virtual machines. If you saw our booth with the TV and the, and the video running, this has a virtual machine that's configured for you to run and access a demo similar on your system. So you can get to playing with it in your labs 
and set it up and learn a little something about FreeSwitch in the process. And you can join our mailing list at list.freeswitch.org or you can go on freeswitch.org and hit the live chat and go right into the hip chat room, ask questions. We'll answer them. We like to see new people come in and, and see what they can do with FreeSwitch. All right. You got a question? Put you on the spot a little bit. I asked David Duffett the same question this morning. Oh no. The asterisk and free switch projects used to be very polarized and there was clear use cases for each. Arguably that polarization has shrunk quite a lot. If I was to ask you today in terms of where the two projects are going and their, dire their direction of travel, how you see the use cases separating out? What would, you, what would your answer be? Well, FreeSwitch does some things Asterisk doesn't do and vice versa. We do video transcoding MCU. We've done Opus forever with WebRTC. Uh, they just gained it officially this week. Um, we kind of started to, to run together in the, the things we do. Some of the things we did, they've adopted and so on and so forth. So the differences between the two projects aren't that big anymore. You know, they have a couple of things like ARI and, and some of those things that we don't have, but we have, you know, Lua and JavaScript and, and HTTAPI and, and some of the other elements you can interact with FreeSwitch. But that's, I, I don't think, uh, I, I think that's just about it. Can't think of anything else. I mean, the two projects are working together. I'm here. They come to our conference and talk. Um, it's been, uh, we, it was a bad relationship in the beginning. I don't know if you guys knew that story, uh, but it's been all repaired, we're all good, we've all grown a little bit, and our priorities are a little bit different in life now, so. <laughs> so what would be the quickest way to get free switch up and running if I didn't have much knowledge of free switch? Starting from a bare Debian Jesse system, the latest updated, and putting the four lines from Confluence on installing and apt get install free switch. And you're, you've got, it'll be installed as quickly as possible with the vanilla configuration. Oh, and we also do Ubuntu 1404 and 1604 packages of free switch. They're rather new. I don't recommend using 14.04 due to the open SSL issues. You'll have to mess around with that to get WebRTC working properly there. Um, it's fixed in 16.04. So if you guys want to use Ubuntu, um, it's great. If you want faster support when you find an issue, Debian is probably your best bet because that's what we all work on is Debian. Any other questions? Well, thank you guys. <laughs>